we're delighted to be back in person again. Uh, thank you for uh, to NYU Abu Dhabi for hosting us for and for all of you for being here with us. Um, I'll, we'll get started with some welcome remarks by our president, Ambassador Silliman. Ambassador Silliman is uh, Douglas Silliman is the president of AGSIW. He was formerly U U.S. ambassador in uh, Kuwait, U.S. ambassador in Iraq, among other things. His bio uh, is in the agenda here, so I won't go uh, into uh, much details. Uh, but Doug, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Raymond. It really is a pleasure to be back at NYU Abu Dhabi. So I want to first thank our hosts and the wonderful venue that they've provided again. We were here three years ago in December of 2019. It was my first live overseas event for AGSIW. It's also my last live overseas event for AGSIW. So we are very happy to be recovering from the pandemic slowdown. Um, and I welcome you all here today. The purpose of the UAE Security Forum is really to ask some very basic questions, and we're going to try to do that this morning. Basic questions like, what is security? Uh, I mean, thinking back to my childhood, for me, security was having my mother tuck me into bed and kiss me on the forehead so I could go to sleep. But security is also going into the kitchen and turning on the tap and knowing that you're going to have water that you can drink. Security is also, for many people, having a job and a paycheck and a clean, safe place uh, to raise, to live or to raise your family. So the definition of security changes over time. It is different for different people, and it has simultaneous meanings for the same person in different situations. We're going to try and scratch at that this morning, try and figure out what actually is security in the Gulf um, and what can we do collectively to expand the security of the Gulf? And that's really the second question we're going to work on. How do you get security? Is security something that you can get onto yourself? For example, as a four-year-old, I'm sitting in my bed. My mother's kissed me, just uh, kissed me goodnight. And there's a funny shadow on my window. There's a monster under my bed. What do I do? Do I just simply stay there? No. I go, I run, and I crawl into bed with my parents or my brother or my sister. If I turn on the tap and the water doesn't work, how do I repair it? Do I do it myself or do I get help from someone? Um, I think what we're finding more and more in individual security is true of countries. You can do things on your own, but it is more effective, uh, more efficient uh, if you do it as a group. So, I mean, the, uh, you can do things on your own. You have more power with your neighbor. You have more power as an entire neighborhood. And one of the things we want to look at today is how can we collectively help strengthen security, provide security across all of the areas that we're looking at. So today we have a number of different panels that are going to look at different types of security. First of all, we'll have a panel that talks about more traditional views of security, military law enforcement uh, cooperation. Uh, we'll have a panel with two distinguished uh, American diplomats to talk about the strategic view of the United States of the region historically, but also into the future. What does the future of the relationships look like? We'll do lunch, and after lunch, we will have a conversation with the, uh, the admiral who commands US naval forces uh, in the Gulf. Uh, we'll talk to him about current cooperation and potential cooperation in the Gulf and potentially beyond into the future. And then our final session this afternoon is going to veer off into the new definition of security, human security. How important is trade, economic cooperation in achieving water security, food security, energy security, and how can Gulf countries and the United States work together on those goals? So uh, as in, by way of introduction, I don't want to get in the way of the real discussion, but I want to welcome you all to NYU Abu Dhabi to the eighth version of UAE Security Forum. And Raymond, I'll get the podium back to you and we can get started. Thank you very much, Doug. And we'll just get started then with the following panel, uh, focusing on regional security cooperation, addressing common threats and challenges. Uh, and with us will come uh, our very good friend, Mohammed Baharoun, a director of uh, Bahuth, uh, a center for studies in Dubai, um, along with uh, Dave DeRoche, a good friend joining us from Washington, DC. He's a non-resident fellow at AGSAW, as well as an associate professor for Near East and South Asia at the Near East and South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. 
uh, Ambassador William Roebuck, uh, Executive Vice President of HASIW and former U.S. Ambassador to Bahrain. And our moderator is my colleague Hussein Ebish, a renowned uh, a scholar and analyst uh, and a contributor to the National uh, and Bloomberg, among other outlets. So please welcome. All right. Well, thank you very much, Raymond. And uh, congratulations on doing another remarkable job of uh, arranging this conference, which is one of the highlights of our year every year. And I think we're all so glad to be back in person and to be able to do it, uh, you know, in, a, in a, at least a kind of a, a hybrid way. And thank you also very much to Ambassador Silliman, who is our, our great leader at AGSIW. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor to work for him. Um, so today we're going to be looking at uh, common security threats. And uh, I think, uh, you know, in his opening remarks, um, Ambassador Suleiman gave us a good sense that uh, of how complex the question of security can be. He raised some pretty important issues about human security, uh, and those need to be addressed uh, collectively. Obviously, things like that in this region. COVID was a very striking example. I think remind uh, countries that they really do need to cooperate on certain things. They cannot, they don't, the, the virus doesn't stop at a border. The virus doesn't care if there are no diplomatic relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia. It's going to spread. The virus doesn't care, uh, you know, about um, internal divisions in a country like Iraq. Iraqis are all you know, liable to get uh, COVID-19. And uh, so, it, it, you know, that's only one example. The, the problem of climate change in this region, it takes on two existential qualities. One is, um, obviously, it has a tremendous impact uh, on the economies of the region, depending on the, you know, the price of oil, because um, most of the Gulf countries are, are oil exporting or energy exporting uh, countries, that's one thing. The other thing is that, um, you know, uh, a rise in th this region can only absorb so much temperature increase <laughs> before it becomes uh, practically uninhabitable, with, uh, you know, or at least would require tremendous leaps in technology to, to make life livable um, if, if the temperatures went up significantly. On the other hand, we have the more traditional security threats that we're familiar with. And I, I think this panel is, is probably more likely to concentrate on, on those a lot, although I would welcome any interventions on human security and collective security and stuff like that. But um, obviously, um, you know, when you talk about common threats, it depends on which perspective. So I'm assuming that we're looking at this from uh, a uh, GCC Gulf countries perspective in common with each other, and in common with the United States. And I think that's where the common comes in. It's, it's not so much in common with Burkina Faso, with all respect to Burkina, uh, or even with Iran, which takes a very different view of the region, where you know, their threat assessment is radically different than uh, that of the United States and, and its regional partners, including uh, Gulf Arab countries. So uh, I want to look at this uh, question of common security threats from, uh, I want to begin with the more typical uh, version of it, and, and the most obvious one uh, in that list that, that would combine American concerns with uh, regional ones is a series of threats posed by Iran. Uh, Iran's network of armed gangs wreaks havoc, it kills American troops, it, it, um, it acts with relative impunity, and it is uh, often in the case of Lebanon and Iraq and Yemen also, uh, but especially and most obviously Lebanon and Iraq, it's a sort of a cancerous presence that prevents the state from resurrecting itself and rebuilding because these groups uh, intervene militarily. They maintain their own uh, foreign and defense policies. They do what they like. Uh, they use force. Uh, so there's no monopoly of force, which is the sort of sine qua non of governance. And um, uh, they, they block progress. They, they can't allow for, for example, in Lebanon, Hezbollah cannot stand the idea of any reform, e even economic reform, threatens them. Because once you start reforming, uh, you can change the system. And they've spent decades arranging the system to their liking. So 
that's one threat posed by Iran. Another is the missiles and drones and hyper-precision guidance, which we'll certainly talk about. Uh, and obviously, the third is the potential nuclear uh, armaments. There are obviously other threats, but here uh, in Abu Dhabi, there was a deadly missile attack in January by the Houthis, who uh, trained by Hezbollah, armed by Iran, encouraged by both of them, uh, actually took the lives of uh, workers in the petroleum industry, not far from, not too far from where we're sitting. Uh, I would call that a common security threat. And um, the United States did recognize that its uh, response to that was insufficient and late and apologized, but I think we can uh, point to uh, an incident that suggests a certain change in the American approach to the use of the large military footprint that it maintains in this region. Uh, and that is that um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Saudi Arabia alerted the United States to a perceived imminent threat of attack from Iran. And the United States confirmed that this was a, a genuine threat and uh, con concurred with the Saudis. And the response, among other things, was for the United States to scramble a bunch of jets and do an aggressive uh, fly over near the Iranian border, uh, which sent a very clear message that the United States was not going to sit idly by. And uh, Kirby, who was the spokesman for the NSC, the White House, etc., um, said the United States would not hesitate to uh, protect, act in defense of its interests and its partners. Uh, this, this sends a very different kind of message. And I think it, uh, there is some evolution in, uh, in that relationship. So let's begin uh, by talking about those kind of common threats. And, and let's start with um, Mohammed Bahroun, who I have you know, the most enormous respect for. And it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, thank you, Hussein, and uh, much appreciation for the Arab Gulf States Institute for organizing uh, this event and maintaining this, uh, you know, uh, resolute approach to maintain this discussion open all of the time in, in, in all of the circumstances. And uh, Doug, I will refer to what you've said. I think what you made it anecdotal, but it's really deep in understanding what does security mean to us and how do we define it. Are we all defining it in the same way or another? But also one more thing to Arab Gulf States Institute to adding the world prosperity to, to security, because that is part of how, you know, maintaining security means that there has to be an objective for security and prosperity is the objective. We've heard this yesterday, uh, not yesterday, two days ago uh, from uh, His Excellency Anwar Kargash when he was speaking at the uh, Abu Dhabi strategic debate. Uh, let me start by talking about, and if, if I may take a few minutes just yes. to... Uh, yeah, no, no, please do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, w this session is about regional security cooperation. I'll take these three words and I'll look at it. But the first thing is that when we're talking about threats, did any transformation happen to this concept of threats? At the beginning, when we were talking about security, the things that really brought us together was very few but very obvious sense of, of security threats. One was terrorism. So the UAE, US partnered in fighting terrorism. Started from Afghanistan and all the way to Yemen very recently. For us, that was uh, uh, you know, a threat that uh, touches us, it does, touches the US, Europe, and the rest of the world. And this is something that we have worked on. The other one, that's the concept of hegemonic states. And we've seen that in the way the US addressed the occupation of Kuwait by Iraq, and also the, what Iran was trying to do in, in the region. And for us, that were the two hegemonic states in the region. There was no other hegemonic states. Syria, with all of its problems, was not a hegemonic state. Lebanon was not. Egypt was not. You know, Yemen was not. It was only these two states. And we had full understanding, full agreement on, on, on that. And then there was this concept of nuclear proliferation. Everyone agreed that we do not want nuclear proliferation in this region, and this is how we work. Now, have these changed? Have they transformed or not? I think there has been a transformation. One, on terrorism. Now we're focusing more on radicalization rather than terrorism itself, because what we see is this is the stem route 
for world cuts. And actually, it creates different type of, 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 of problems that are not you know, easily categorized as terrorism. And I think this is one of those departure lines on where do we stand. You have to be an international terrorist organization for us to work together against them. If you're a radical, then that's a gray area. So that was one of those areas where that definition did not match. The other one was the concept of the hegemonic state. So yes, until today, the US is very strict about hegemony and even aggression, as we've seen with this, uh, in the case in, in Ukraine. But when it comes to non-state actors, there is no much agreement on how do we deal with them, even though it's a tool of hegemony, but it's an indirect tool of hegemony. So we don't have an agreement on how to deal with armed non-state actors that operate transnationally. I don't think the US and the UAE and, and the rest of the GCC have an understanding on that. You were right. And then there's got the issue of nuclear proliferation. Uh, we've talked about proliferation, nuclear proliferation, but suddenly for us comes in JCPOA that makes in, in enrichment acceptable at the point when we all agree that we don't want enrichment in the region because it's a pathway to, to proliferation. But other than that, we are now suffering from proliferation of drones technology and missile technology, as you pointed out. Again, there is no tools for us to cooperate on how do we address that type of challenge. And, and that also, that they, they dovetail. The non-state actors, in many cases, especially Absolutely. Iran's clients, use those drones and, and Ab precision Absolutely. guns. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, uh, th there are causes for those transformations. They did not just happen. There are things that has changed with us in the GCC, and there are things that has changed in the US. One of the things that that changed was this concept of economic transformation. Here in the GCC, everyone is thinking about post oil. They're creating their own plans for, for post oil, which means our natural or uh, traditional relationship with the US, which is based on oil for security, started to change. Also the US, they started their own energy uh, and independence strategies. They don't want to be reliant on this region. So that traditional relationship has went down. Another thing was that they're creating, as, as you pointed out with the COVID, new type of global challenges that required us to, to operate in a different way when we define our security structures. So when you're trying to build down a national security matrix, it's not only the neighbors around you, it's other countries that you will need to work with, but you cannot even coerce. So it, this has pushed us to a different type of, 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 of doctrines. So because of that oil, um, and this is my own private view, is that this Carter Doctrine is not there anymore when it's this, this, the US is going to fight whenever you know, oil, which used to be a critical commodity for the US, is no more a critical commodity. It's a, an important, significant, but it's not critical. So there is no chapter five. Can, can I ask you a, a question on this? I, I don't, I, come, I, you can come back, of course, here, but, but I, I just want to explore this for a second. The question of the Carter Doctrine, it seems to me, uh, it, it, it still exists, but the, as far as I can tell, the question is, no one here in this part of the world is, knows what would trigger it. In other words, it, there, you're right, there's no Article 5 uh, understanding, so abkek and chores can happen without a response, things like that, uh, things like the drone uh, attacks or rocket attacks here in Abu Dhabi. Uh, without calling for a kinetic response, a military response. However, um, we see the, the quick response to the recent Iranian threat, and we've seen other actions by the United States that were military in response. So the, I would suggest that perhaps the question of the Carter Doctrine is one of, 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 of trigger, what the trigger is. What's the, what would... Uh, how would what would cause the United States to respond? There is no confidence here about that uh, because the Carter Doctrine really addresses um, late 20th century threats: Saddam Hussein's tanks rolling into Kuwait City through the oil fields, etc. Th that's not the security nightmare of today. Security nightmare of today involves things like drones and rockets and non-state actors and cyber attacks and next generation sabotage and all that kind of stuff, which is very different. Uh, and so it seems to me that more 
it, it's, it's a, there's an, a need for an understanding about what would trigger a response, because there are responses. And then there are incidents without responses. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, thank you. I mean, you, you, you're right. And again, I'm not. This is not a way of, of, of saying that the U.S. is doing something right or wrong. No, it's I just understand. an analytical way of trying yeah. to see how right. things have laid out. And I was uh, th uh, adding are, that gloss. Just yeah, go right uh, ahead. Uh, there are other doctrines that came in. The the, the, the burden sharing doctrine that came in during the Obama is is a new doctrine that was not there, and it was based on all of those changes that has happened. Also from us in our region, and we've heard this several times, this de-escalation doctrine that's coming from the UAE. Uh, UAE does not want to engage in military action anymore because it sees that the, 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 the need to cooperate is possibly much higher. And exactly as you said, when it came to COVID-19, our approach to, to Iran, we cannot force Iran to do things. We chose to help Iran yeah. to do it the right thing. humanitarian aid to Iran. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, I will come back again later on uh, to talk about how does this impact security architectures and, and, and what does it mean to the U.S.-UAE uh, uh, type of relationship great. on security. Well, that was a great rundown of, of, of how the threats have changed and how they're perceived here. And I'd like to ask uh, Ambassador Robach to sort of uh, comment on uh, Muhammad's thread of, of ideas that, that are, are come from a UAE perspective, from an American perspective, how did that sound to you? How do you think that that general set of, of ideas about how what threats are and how they've transformed, how, how does that resonate in Washington? What do you think? Uh, thank you, Hussein. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, especially with you moderating. We go back a long ways. Happy to be here with Muhammad and with um, with David. Our dear friend Dave. Yes. yes. Um, let me just say a couple of uh, opening remarks about uh, the way I perceive um, some of the uh, challenges um, that we're talking about today. And then I'll, uh, I'll say a word about Mohammed's uh, comments. Um, I think if, if I were looking at the types of uh, challenges that uh, states in this region face, and that includes, of course, UAE, um, there, I, I see two in sort of traditional threats of the type we're, we're talking about in this panel. Um, challenges of what I would call challenges of place or regional um, challenges and challenges in relations. And both of them can cause uh, security concerns and have to be uh, dealt with in order to um, address them as, as, as threats. Um, let me talk about each of these in um, a short uh, bit. In terms of challenges of of place. I mean, in, in the shorthand way, this is uh, fairly obvious as a regional uh, threat, a regional concern. Um, one could uh, mention the um, threat from Iran. One could uh, refer to the uh, long and continuing uh, challenge of reintegrating Iraq back into the Gulf Arab world, uh, which uh, has the objective of trying to reduce Iranian influence in, in Iraq but also to give some added strategic depth to uh, the Gulf Arab region, as a, at least that's the aspiration for, for uh, working on this, this issue with, with Iraq. But these are like, I would call them uh, ch tr classic challenges of, of place or um, regional challenges. But I want to talk about two other uh, challenges uh, that are, are, are generally characterized as challenges of place. One of them is, I would call them challenges of broader regional entanglements. Um, here I'm talking about Yemen uh, or Libya. Um, these are uh, conflict situations where neighbors um, in, the, in, the, in the Gulf have in one way or another gotten involved and then decided to, um, in some cases, extricate. Um, but they're not... Uh, Yemen is a situation where the Emirates, for example, has uh, withdrawn and uh, moved on. Um, Saudi Arabia is still caught in that particular um, broader entanglement. I also think um, Libya represents another example where um, regional states have gotten involved in um, broader peripheral, um, I mean physical periphery uh, conflicts. And this is, it poses the type of challenge to their security that they've got to figure their way through. Um, and then the, the third type of uh, physical 
or, or place uh, relationship um, I would describe is challenges to, of, of a broader horizon. And when I talk about challenges of broader horizon, I'm talking about the um, presence of the Abraham Accords. And when I say it's a, it's a challenge in a security uh, framework, I really mean in, in a benevolent sense. But it's a, it's a challenge that the states here have to find ways to manage. They need to make sure that the, uh, the, the relations that they, the, the Abrahamic states, uh, Bahrain and UAE, have established are going to be beneficial, beneficial to both uh, sides of the equation, the Israelis, but also to the, the Emiratis, to the, to the Bahrainis. Um, and that is a challenge. It's something that the states have to work with. Um, the other, uh, you know, challenge on, sorry, the other challenge on that front is the states in the region who have not entered into Abraham Accords with Israel, and they are going to need to address uh, the reality of the relations that have been established, which uh, now give Israel a presence in the Gulf and um, puts them in a situation where they have to, I, I would say, um, at their own pace and in their own ways, uh, develop those relationships with Israel that, that they see are in their interest and that they will do over, um, over time. Um, there are also, in addition to these challenges of, of place, the different ones I mentioned, there are also challenges of relations. Um, and there are many uh, challenges. Mohammed, you mentioned um, several of them. Um, I would just emphasize uh, being a, an American am ambassador and being in charge of relations with one of those states when I was there in Bahrain. Um, these um, states are trying to establish and improve relations with the United States. Um, and this is a, it's a difficult um, uh, situation to, to work through sometimes. Um, I think traditionally the United States has been viewed as a strategic partner uh, with a, a lasting commitment to the region, but that has come under question in recent um, times, I would say in recent years. Um, and there's three reasons for it I would just want to lay out quickly. One, I think that the United States um, over the past couple of years has become distracted in some ways from uh, the region. And there are a couple of, of uh, causes for that. I think there's been a huge debate about our presence here in the region, back in Washington, in the broader United States. Um, I think this debate on force posture has distracted, in some ways, U.S. focus on the region, and um, it has had an impact on perceptions out here about how um, solid a partner the U.S. is in, mm -hmm. in helping these uh, countries uh, protect their, their security. It's a reliability question. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, you know, there are a couple of um, factors that have uh, fed into this uh, problem. Um, the force security debate has been influenced by our withdrawal from Afghanistan. Mm. I think the, the force security posture debate has also been influenced by the, uh, the, our strategic pivot to Asia and the, um, the effort to develop a strategic focus that would deal with the challenge uh, that China poses. And um, these have fed into that uh, debate. Um, but I think my, my own sense is that the debate has been significantly resolved. Yeah. And I believe that it has been resolved uh, in a way that says basically this region is of strategic importance yeah. to the United States. It is, it is clear um, and that the United States will maintain the basic security architecture that it has that uh, spreads out across the region. Um, we have huge naval assets in Bahrain, for example, which we'll hear about later today, but it's in nearly all of the countries. There is some piece or significant pieces of that security architecture, um, whether it's train and equip programs uh, in Saudi Arabia, um, arms sales, um, and other types of uh, architecture or uh, programmatic uh, elements and aspects. So um, 
I, I raised the issue about the uh, forced posture debate and the, the elements that have fed into it. Just to say that, in my view, this, this issue, I believe it's been largely uh, resolved. I think the, the Biden visit to the region mm -hmm. uh, made this clear. I think yeah. in the way they signaled the visit before it, it took place, and then in things that they said during the visit, I think President Biden was, was trying to um, send that signal that yeah. this is a region of strategic importance. We're not going to abandon it, right. and we're not going to leave it. I, I completely agree with that, if I may say. And I, you know, I think there's been a belated understanding uh, that took time to sink in about uh, what a huge strategic advantage U.S. dominance of the waters of the Gulf and uh, the three great choke points of the region, the Suez Canal, the uh, uh, Mandab and the, and the uh, Strait of Hormos, mm -hmm. uh, is just a, a tremendous source of leverage over, over China and other potential mm -hmm. rivals, mm -hmm. and that the, 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 the would be sort of um, uh, strategic malpractice. Uh, to abandon it. So I, I, I do think that's a, now shared by everyone except the isolationists on the left and right. Mm -hmm. So I think you're absolutely right about that. A couple more quick points. Sure. Um, one other factor that I think has distracted the United States uh, significantly in the past uh, few years have been our elections. Uh, our recent elections uh, largely resolved now. It looks like um, Republicans have taken the House, Democrats um, have mm -hmm. taken the Senate. Um, President Biden, of course, remains in the White House. So we're going to have a period of divided government. Um, I think in some ways, because Democrats outperformed, I think President Biden uh, feels empowered. I think he will need to move more to the center and away from his left mm. uh, flank of, of the party. And this will help, actually. Um, it will weaken him some domestically. But I think in terms of management of foreign relations and particularly management of relations in this area, uh, in, in the Gulf, in the Arab Gulf area, it will help um, in uh, his ability and, and the way he's able to focus on this region. It's early days. We, we're, we're not sure yet how the, uh, those election results will impact, but my sense is that it will be helpful overall in the way he manages the relationship. In, in two ways, if I may. One is uh, the, the, um, uh, this election was a huge victory for the Democratic Party Center because they nominated centrists, very few uh, far leftists or, or you know, real strong progressives were nominated. And so the fact that the party did exceptionally well with a very centrist set of, of uh, midterm candidates is a strong victory for the center and for Biden, who represents and leads that center. You know, if Jim Clyburn is sort of the, the guru, uh, Biden is the leader. And I think that the other thing, so that's, that's very good for the region. Uh, it's also helpful uh, for Saudi-US relations that the Democrats didn't get a shellacking mm -hmm. because the blame game would have been very uncomfortable for Saudi Arabia. That's not gonna happen. The, the other thing is that this um, arrangement of a very small, maybe three or four vote uh, Republican majority in the House with a Democratic Senate and a Democratic centrist president might even be almost the ideal um, political balance for Gulf countries. It mm -hmm. sets them up really perfectly. And, and I think they'll, it's, a, it's a pretty sound arrangement for them politically in the United States. Just a couple more quick uh, uh, comments. Um, a second uh, challenge in terms of the relationship between the United States and this region, I think has to do with the fact that in the la last few years and, and longer, the region has been evolving. Um, it, is, it looks at the world differently. It sees a multipolar world. It sees a, a world uh, where its interests are better pursued, uh, where it strategically diversifies its approach and doesn't rely on one um, power. I think countries in the region are well entrenched in that approach, and I think the United States has been a bit slow in appreciating it, and um, it's, I think that, that maybe falls on us, I think on the United States, to, um, to look for ways to um, adapt our policies to these realities. I don't think they're going to change their approaches here, and I think well, we're going to need to look for ways 
uh, to better appreciate that strategic diversification. Yeah. I do think um, that both sides are going to need, or both um, Gulf countries and the United States are going to need to re-examine the fundamental bargain about mm -hmm. what it is, what is the implicit bargain right. um, that is driving the relationship. It used to be oil for security or something along those lines. With strategic diversification and um, you know, the evolving of uh, the way uh, the, the Gulf countries uh, look at their, uh, the, a multipolar world, we may, I think we're going to need to re-examine that and, and yeah. both sides are going to have to contribute to that. And the final point that I would make uh, that is affecting the relationship and is making it difficult is, is the conflict in the Ukraine. Yeah. I think that the two, the two sides, I mean the Gulf and the United States, um, are two, represent two fundamental um, perspectives on that conflict. Yep. The, the Gulf countries, by and large, the um, big chunks of China, the global south, generally see that conflict, as, as Hussein said yesterday, as a border war in, in Europe. It isn't a conflict that requires them to fundamentally change all of their um, regional or, or um, economic arrangements and uh, alignments. They, they don't see it as posing that level of a threat. Yeah, it's not a macro-historical inflection point. For right. Them, right. Whereas the United States, Europe, and the others who are aligned with the United States mm -hmm. do see it in that way. And I would just I close with this. The United States is putting tremendous strategic emphasis on this conflict and very, very senior level attention, uh, marshalling resources, marshalling uh, all of the institutions of, of uh, diplomatic and security power that they can to affect that uh, conflict in the way that we want it to, to develop. And I think on this issue, uh, I, my sense is that the region out here may need to um, to move a bit in the way it mm -hmm. addresses that issue. Yeah. Uh, just in order to uh, handle that huge American um, footprint, that huge American focus on it, um, without, ha without moving to do that, I think they're going to get uh, crossways in some ways, and it's going to create some frictions. Yeah. Thank you. No, th that was an enormously sophisticated response. Uh, to um, Hamad's very sophisticated um, outline. So I'd like to bring Dave in and sort of shift. You've been very patient. Uh, I'd, I'd like to kind of um, shift to a different aspect uh, and sort of, um, you know, uh, narrow the aperture a little bit uh, and talk about the way in which security in, in a military context, right, has evolved in recent years. Um, the Ukraine war, the war in Syria, the, uh, a couple of other wars, and especially the Ukraine war, have uh, demonstrated the, uh, the ways in which combat has been evolving uh, as, a, as a practical craft in the, you know, in the 2020s, in, you know, here in, in, as we approach the end of the first quarter of, of the new century. So how do you think, two questions. Number one, how, how do you think warfare as a, as a practical craft is evolving? You know, uh, what do we see? What do we learn from these conflicts, right? And, uh, and how does that impact this region, right? Because there may be important lessons that just don't apply here. And, and so if you could talk about all of that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, it's, you know... Uh... So you've had Renoir and Monet, and now it's time for Jackson Pollock. Um, <laughs> you know, when I was when I was listening to Mohammed, particularly in Ambassador Roebuck, I realized that security is not really a measurable, tangible thing. It's a psychological right. construct. You're secure if you think you're secure. Yeah. Um, you know, when I when I moved to London for the first time, my mother was worried because of terrorism in England, and I pointed out that I had a greater chance of dying a violent death as a male in Los Angeles County than if right. I were a British soldier in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, so Statistically. Well, yeah, and, and 
the, the challenge with security of our partners here is that um, I think there's an expectation gap. Um, I know that at the time of the Arab Spring, the, the American commitment to preserve their national integrity was often mistaken for a commitment to preserve the ruling regime. Yeah. And, um, you know, I know that partners in the region say, well, we want NATO Article 5-like guarantees. Well, look, two, sol two civilians just died in Poland as a result of a Russian strike. Either it was a Russian missile or a Ukrainian missile to intercept it. Article 5 has not been invoked. Right. So that security presence is, is not what, what people think it is. But when we look at the developments in warfare, what's really interesting is we've seen that in the Gulf region in particular, and in the West, uh, warfare, particularly control of fires and precision fires, has been moving towards a more hierarchical system, uh, top-driven. We talk of developing a network. We want to have integrated sensors, fusers, and firers. But that network is a network with a spider at the center of it. It's, mm. it's like the web of a black widow, mm -hmm. where it comes towards the center. And um, ironically, the amount of senior level involvement has increased. It actually, because of the... You think it's become more centralized? It has become more centralized. Uh, primarily, the American experience in Afghanistan and Iraq, where the minimization of civilian casualties was critical, mm. Um, a call for fire now takes longer, took longer in Iraq than it took in World War II, yeah. in spite of all the technological increases. What we've seen in the Ukraine, by contrast, is not, we see a network, but it's not a network with a central node. It's a decentralized, multimodal network right. where most of the effective fires from drones um, are conducted at the squad, platoon, and company level. Mm -hmm. And instead of multiple fusers feeding into a network that then uh, distributes the fires, we see a model more like Uber, yeah. where a target is identified and then the f closest firing asset, whether that could be rockets, missiles, tube artillery, or even tanks operating in indirect fire mode, yeah. are directing accurate fires. What accelerates this uh, thing is that we're also seeing very cheap, precise weapons that yep. can have a strategic effect, like the Garand 136 stroke, or Garand or Shahid 136 Iranian drones that right. are being fired at civilian infrastructure. Hmm. They're incapable of operating against mobile infrastructure or mobile military sure. units, but, but a they're fixed cheap. Target. Yeah, and, very and, cheap. and they're very easy. So we see that decentralization. At C, um, we're likely, I think, to see. Um, and, and the lack of emphasis in both the United States mm. and in the Gulf states, it still mystifies me, but naval mines, mm. which um, continue. If, if you look at U.S. Navy ships lost to enemy action since the end of World War II, we've lost three times as many ships to mines as yeah. to everything else and, combined. And mines were a key uh, factor in Iran's maximum resistance. And campaign, still, and know, still are. Whether above the waterline or below the waterline, they, they've used a lot of mines to make well, the point. Well, and it's quite possible that the straits are already mined. Oh, I'm sure and they, they are. And they just need to yeah. be done. But, yeah. but let me close on a positive point, which is for those who doubt the U.S. commitment, it is still a factor that there are more U.S. The U.S. Navy has more of its mine sweeping assets in the Gulf yeah. than in the rest of the world combined. Right. Because of the strait. Yeah. Well, you know, the Chinese can produce mines as well. Well, I understand that. Uh, understand. Yeah, and so, you know, when we talk of the pivot to Asia, and I, I'm sorry to disagree with you, Ambassador, so please. please. But um, from a military standpoint, the pivot is a lot of sizzle, not a whole lot of steak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't point no, I, to a specific facility that's been built. Honestly, the only tangible yeah. results of the pivot I see is a brigade of Marines playing volleyball in so Darwin. I'm, I'm with you. I don't see a pivot. I see an aspiration and an intention, but I don't see a pivot. I have a question. Yeah. Um, sure. So in, on centralization and decentralization, yeah. we are, those of us who know nothing of these matters, uh, reading the newspaper, uh, get the impression that the Russian military is bogged down by intensive centralization and the decision making is highly centralized and, and is very top down and that they don't have empowered um, uh, sort of junior officer or lower level officers, uh, platoon mm -hmm. leaders, uh, you know, NCOs, technical NCOs right. or others, 
or, or, or combat NCOs that, they, that, that have power, that have the authority to make decisions, whereas we get the impression that the Ukrainians, especially these mobile uh, missile uh, units, um, sort of have a good deal of, of um, rapid, uh, you know, decentralized decision making that they can identify a target and on their own move and yeah. follow them around and what have you. It, it, talk to me about that. Okay, so there's, there's two sides to that argument, I think. The first one is, yeah, it is true that the, um, in general, what we're finding is that the Russians are not capable of operating this multi, multi-modal Mm. Uh, warfare because of the lack of empowerment of junior leaders and unfortunately yeah. that is a problem here as well in in this region as well the lack of empowerment of junior leaders to actually have effective uh, control except the Wagner group mm. which is highly decentralized mm. and which is probably the most effective combat formation of the Russian yeah. forces so where you see that empowerment you do that but a that's caveat. that's a, a very interesting version of uh, Muhammad's non-state actor. Exactly, it's a quasi non-state actor. It's 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 an empowered non-state actor. Well, sure. Um, but the caveat is, you could argue that this is not necessarily a function of command and design, but rather a function of logistics. They, these organizations want to operate externally, but you know the Russian forces are operating on the outside of the crescent and just yes. cannot rapidly shift operations, whereas the Ukrainians operating inside with internal communications, they're able to shift resources more quickly, more rapidly in a hot, less in a friendly environment. Yeah. And so perhaps the logistical advantages of internal lines, I don't want to get all staff college on you, no, no, but this the, is, this is, the yeah. internal logistics enable that independence of operation as well as mm. the eight years of development of junior leaders we've seen since the invasion of Ukraine. Is that Ukraine. one of the big lessons uh, of the Ukraine war so far for uh, Gulf Arab countries and their military development? So what are the big lessons? So that way? Gulf Arab countries, oh, all regional. I cannot think of a single Arab army which has what anybody in the West would consider to be a non-commissioned and junior officer corps capable of independent operation mm. as required multimodal mm. operations. Mm. I, cannot, I cannot see any one of those. And the problem is they come to us for assistance, but our concept of network-based warfare is not really independent operation at junior level. It's what independent sensors fusing into the center it's that the, then the gives It's the Black a, Widow you described. Initially. Exactly. Yeah, so, right. so we tend to reinforce uh, what I would regard as a suboptimal force design. Yeah. Would, w w would you recommend that Gulf militaries take that lesson about empowered, uh, you know, junior officers? It's, and this is going to be a fundamental cultural shift, but, yeah. but absolutely. You and I, I think that, that um, uh, my recommendation would be to move from Western model mm. armies towards uh, things that are more akin to um, mobile groups with mm. self-sustaining logistics that are capable of independent operations, uh, probably below brigade level, mm -hmm. like, a, like a, a regimental combat team kind of yeah. organization. So lieut lieutenants and, and uh, sergeants. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, uh, any other key lessons before before we come back to well uh, this this is this is a, a universal truth to me but people get it uh, it's worth saying here because it applies to this people's concept of air and missile defense particularly mm -hmm. missile defense yeah. is it's it's like the dome in the Simpsons movie it's just a dome that goes in all missile defense is point defense yeah. yeah and the idea of a universal defense that does it no 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 right. um and what we're seeing is the russian campaign against civilian infrastructure mm -hmm. is doing that they're, they're right. basically saying okay military targets key command and control are protected they can't protect every tr electricity transformer in the country we'll sure. target those yeah and so this idea that you know if you have patriot um abu dhabi is protected no, right. no. key points within abu dhabi are protected right um, just as, you know, there, there are no Patriot batteries defending Washington, D.C. Right. Um, yeah. You know, so, so that's, that, unfortunately, vulnerable. people have this idea that if you have missile defense, you have invulnerability, and that is not the case. Yeah, I, I want to 
come back to missile defense okay. in a minute. But um, let's let's do it. Let's pick up on a different thread from Ukraine, uh, and then we'll talk <clears throat> missile defense for sure. Um, but Hamad, there are uh, two th issues that get raised um, by um, what Dave was saying about uh, Ukraine. One is the the question of um, uh, well, no, actually, let's come back. Let's do, let's do missile defense. I'm wrong. Let's start with missile defense. <laughs> the U.S. is pushing for has been for decades promoting the idea of greater. Uh, integration of air and missile defense. And that was really the big ask of uh, Joe Biden uh, when he came in July to, to uh, Jeddah and, and attended the uh, uh, GCC plus three uh, meeting. And it's been a, uh, it's also been the focus of this working group on Iran uh, that uh, may or may not be meeting again. I, I'm not sure. I know what the last <coughs> one was postponed is one of the uh, you know, uh, symbolic gestures of, of annoyance by the United States after the OPEC plus uh, uh, quota um, freak out. Um, but I'm wondering if two things. Number one, if there's any progress towards reducing a resistance in Gulf and other Arab countries to greater integration and interoperability uh, uh, you know, because the, the, the rising threat from things like you know, drones and rockets and with precision guidance that even non-state actors can use uh, very cheaply, as Dave said, and very effectively, uh, especially against unguarded targets that you pointed out. Um, and also, uh, potentially, there's some progress because of the early warning radars that Israel has, um, that are, are, are sort of part of the Iron Dome system that Israel has uh, placed in UAE and Bahrain uh, after the uh, rocket, deadly rocket attacks, drone attacks, whatever they were on, in Abu Dhabi uh, in January. So now you have these Israeli systems uh, and um, that looks like potentially a step towards a kind of integration, because you have a, a triangle there. And I don't know if that's true or not. And I don't know if there's any greater openness to this idea. Um, because from a US perspective, it's key to getting greater um, defense, greater protection against this increasing threat of flying bombs. OK, I mean. Uh... You're uh, asking a, sort of a difficult question here. Mm. Uh, b difficult because it's very tactical mm. in, in a sense, mm. but the problem is not the tactical aspect. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, they've mentioned this idea of, of, of cheap weapons. Uh, he talked about drones, he talked mm. about mines. This is the problem with drones. I mean, we're talking about something the size of, of one by two meters that can be assembled easily inside the country, launched mm -hmm. from inside mm -hmm. the country. If you're talking about a missile, then you have to measure you know, the distance it has to travel. If you're talking about a drone, where can you smuggle it into? You can launch it out of a, of a, of a marine, uh, out of a boat, a, a marine structure. You can bring it inside, launch it from inside the country. So that makes the whole concept, you know, uh, we would need to reconsider the, the idea of one, what are the threats and how do we address them? Uh, uh, the other uh, issue is that... Well, well, hold on. Are you suggesting that there isn't, uh, and this may well be true, that there is effectively no ex extant good protection against precision drones? Yes. There is. There is not. There is not. There's okay. Not. There is there's not. not. So, all right. So then... The there's, there's not one system that... There's, yeah. There's not the Acme drone killer. No, I, I understand. Yeah. But so... Is there a system of systems? I, I will leave Dave to answer that here. Well, yeah. well, well, okay. Well, let's let's table it because it doesn't. Okay, it I don't. I, really, yeah, I, I don't want. Well, it doesn't really change my question to the, Muhammad. Next, the, go on. Yes. Exactly. The the idea I want to get to is mm. that okay. With all of these challenges, how does this impact our thinking about security? Where does it leave us, mm -hmm. and where does it lead us? And I think if we cannot really achieve 
this concept of defense against non-state actors. I mean, uh, face it, I mean, since the Iran-Iraq war, Iran has not been engaged directly in an invasion of any other country. But that doesn't mean did not attack. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there are different ways of attacking, there are mm -hmm. different ways of pressure, mm -hmm. but it's not direct. Right. So state to state, and I think the U.S. is also doing the same thing. It has refrained from an open fire with, with Iran. Uh, Iran has downed a, a drone, a very sophisticated drone. We did not, even when Trump was in, in, in charge, mm -hmm. we did not see the, a reaction where mm -hmm. you engage directly. Right. So where does that leave you? It leaves you in a position where you have to think differently. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean, differently? Now, if I cannot defend, then I will have to go to deterrence. So what does deterrence mean? If I cannot you know, uh, uh, prevent Iran from attacking me from other groups, mm. then Iran has to understand that. I'm, and this is exactly what Israel is doing. Yeah. You know, uh, and and I don't, I'm not saying that the Israeli approach to Iran is right or wrong. I'm not saying that this is the right approach, but this is the questions you have to put when you're continuing. Uh, you, you've talked about regiment level, uh, mm -hmm. small uh, autonomous groups. Mm -hmm. This is what you've mentioned is Wagner. But where yeah. did Wagner come? Blackwater. You're the guys who perfected the, the concept, and yeah. we've sort of looked into it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean, um, we're now talking about a possible you know, uh, uh, cooperation with, with something like Wagner. When would the Chinese have their own Wagners? They, the Turks are already thinking about it. Mm -hmm. When will they have, and what type of operation? And how easy would it be to cooperate with them? Yeah. And what stops you from operating with them? You're not operating with a state. You're mm -hmm. using, you know, but mm -hmm. this whole concept did not come from anywhere except the U.S. You're the people who created it. You perfected it, yeah. and you sold it to the world. And now the world is knocking it off, you know. So again, this is something you started for operational reasons, for budgetary reasons, for a number of, of other reasons. But now it's becoming a fad. Everyone is adopting it. Mm -hmm. And if I want to say, uh, I mean, if I want to be provocative, I would say what the U.S. is doing with Ukraine is the same problem, uh, the same issue, uh, approach. You see at the state level. Uh, the same approach Iran did with the Houthis. Huh. That yeah. you arm well, indirectly, you, you support you, yeah. small groups. Uh, well, yeah. Hang on, yeah. though. There's a, there's, uh, isn't there? An, uh, I mean, I understand what you're saying in, in terms of, uh, of sort of uh, structures, but um, Ukraine is not the Houthis. Ukraine is a UN member state, and the Houthis are engaged in a in a uh, violent rebellion mm. uh, against a government. Whereas Ukraine is responding to an unprovoked invasion, so there is you know some different. No, no, my, my my point is that in engagement, yeah. the U.S. is not directly engaging. No, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Directly it's a, with it's the use of a proxy. Exactly. So, I understand. So the approaches no, that Iran that. has used with with, our, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong. Again, yeah. I'm just trying to be descriptive when. Yeah. These are the challenges you're facing with. If you go and, and, and actually yeah. fight with the Ukrainians, you're triggering in, in, in a world war, a nuclear war. If, if the U.S. engaged directly with Russia, yes. So that's one reason why things like the, uh, the attack in Poland or the deaths in Poland are not being mm -hmm. uh, treated as an Article 5 trigger, because that would be a crazy overreaction Absolutely. and madness, and Absolutely. so no one wants it. Absolutely. But the impact is, yeah. is that people look at those new type of structures of engagement, mm -hmm. and they try and apply it. Mm. So this is the type of, of you know, unintended consequence yeah. of this yeah. is the way to do things in the future. Yeah. Support non-state actors. Support, um, arm. You, you could argue that the UAE is possibly doing the same thing in, in Yemen. You yeah. know, it would draw directly, mm -hmm. but it didn't draw fully. Mm -hmm. Now, the impact overall is that once we start acting in response to an irregular situation, mm -hmm. by an irregular uh, mm -hmm. action, mm -hmm. irregularity becomes the regular aspect. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> is, I, I mean, I think that's a good point. Um, so, you're basically arguing, just to make it clear, that, that um, Gulf countries uh, have basically no choice but to engage in this now almost universal practice? Is, is, or or mm, simply no. that's the reality? <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying that. Okay, what? I'm saying these are the options that are available because of this transformation yeah. of, of challenges. And uh, allow me to, to yes, name please. them. Yeah. The, the, the Go three of right them. ahead. <laughs> uh, one, uh, that 
the, the new form is that coalition of the willings. Yemen is an, is an approach. Yeah. And the, you know, Saudi right. Arabia, UAE did it by the book. Yeah. They went to the UN, they got a, a resolution, mm -hmm. they got people to think. And at that point of time, even the US was, was glad because yes. for them, it seems mm -hmm. this is the burden sharing. Yeah, You're taking exactly. responsibility of that. The other is this concept of return of deterrence. Now, people will have to think about deterrence, and we've heard it. People saying that if Iran owns you know, a nuclear weapon, we will have to own a nuclear weapon, because there will be no other way of doing it. Yeah. What we've seen now in Ukraine is, again, the return of deterrence. You know, uh, uh, yeah. Russia cannot use its nuclear weapon because it understands that the US mm -hmm. and its allies will have to use nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. and that's a deterrence. So for us, the deterrence you know, argument is back on the table, and mm -hmm. everyone is thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Very dangerous it's, argument. I was going to say, this, actual, is a, this is a dangerous situation you've described, the, no doubt. The other thing that is happening, and I think this is what the UAE is trying to do, mm. is, is the non-conflict approach, yeah. which yeah. is the de-escalation, yeah. cooperation, creating new cooperative mm -hmm. structures. This is what the UAE is trying to do as an alternative. Yeah, I understand. So these yeah. are the way we're, we're dealing. Now, where, what the US can do about it, in, mm. in, in, in its... And I think we will go back to those three words. Yep. Regional, security, cooperation. Understood. When it comes to regional, mm -hmm. honestly, drop regional. Mm. There is nothing regional about this region at all. Mm. It's very global. In global, itself. yeah. It looks at itself as part of a global. And if, if we're not talking about energy, security of the world, it has to happen here. Mm. So there is an, an, you know, our relationship with, with Brazil, our relationship with Argentina, mm -hmm. with Europe, with China, yeah. with India, with Israel, with, with, this is a regional approach. So we want to talk about security. It cannot only be regional security. It has to be a global security. Mm. Now, again, uh, the concept of security, uh, you want to create a regional security. This is my you know, let's say imagination if you mm -hmm. want, and it's something I wrote about. If you want really to find some sort of, of, of you know, access, stability, why not bring the GCC to NATO? Create a NATO plus of some sort. I understand NATO is a democrat, democratic club. If you're mm -hmm. not a democracy, you're not a, a, you know, involved. Yeah. And I understand With a couple that. of exceptions. Well, uh, uh, this is the, <laughs> well, but yeah. they've Turkey created something. Yeah. They've created something. Well, Turkey at that point was a democratic country. Yeah, it was, uh, sort of, yeah. Uh, I believe it still is, but then that's... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, they created the Istanbul Initiative. Yeah, yeah. That Istanbul Initiative can be expanded to become a NATO plus. Yes. There is value for NATO mm -hmm. because it can bring its ability reach to new regions that it was not there. Yeah. Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. can bring in people, and it, it's not the U.S. that will pay the security bill for an attack. It mm -hmm. will be the whole of NATO. Yeah. Now, right now, at least, I think, three Gulf countries are part of, of, of the Istanbul Initiative, mm. Qatar, UAE, and, and Bahrain, mm. actually for Kuwait mm. as well. Mm. So they are already part of, of that yes. initiative. Uh, they train like the NATO, and mm. they fight with NATO. Mm. They fought with them in Libya. Yeah. Mm. You know, this is, they've shed blood, <laughs> if you want, for NATO. Not but sure, NATO yes. does not provide the opposite type of, of, of commitment. All what, we, all what NATO provides now is training and, and standardization. Let, let, me, so, uh, let, let me get the response, because that's... Uh, oh, you uh, have... Uh, 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 I, one, want, one uh, I want to explore that, but go ahead. The, the last word in, yeah. in these three uh, regional security cooperation is the word cooperation. Yeah. Until this point, we don't see the U.S. as the leader of cooperative... Yeah. Uh, and mm. used mm. to be... Mm. U.S. was yeah. behind most of those new right. governments or governance structures that, you know, helps with leadership. Now it's not. And the latest duel with the OPEC Plus is one of those. Op op yeah. There is no successor, right? It's, it's, it's an, op an open field. No one is but the it, clear leader, correct? A, at this point, U.S. is against cooperation governance structures like OPEC Plus. It's not with it. I mean, I understand the U.S. might not want to join and lead from within, but the point is that as long as we have regional, not regional, global cooperation structures, it has to lead. I mean, I was sort of glad to hear that one of the uh, uh, objectives of the U.S. by U uh, joining the I2U2 mm. was create more cooperation mm. when it comes to infrastructure. Yeah. And to me, in my understanding, this is the 
future road, road and build initiatives. Right. Mm. So but until I, now, I, I it's not happening. This. I mean, infrastructure gives uh, solidity to this new era yeah. of, of non non. So it needs to lead on, on those existing ones. Yeah. It needs to create new ones. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, um, and, and next month we'll be discussing. Uh, I don't know if Janandra is here, but the uh, uh, Anwar Gargash Diplomatic Academy yes. is making a you know a workshop on blue economy right. and its mm-hmm. role mm-hmm. as a new cooperative mo- uh, let, framework. Let me let me get sorry. Uh, last one, okay. de-escalation, which is the new yeah. doctrine of the UAE. Where can you create yeah. links? To that, let's support yeah. the escalation. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. talking if, if the U.S. says this is a good approach, it can help us. How can we magnify it? Theoretically, the U.S. The is for approach. it. Mm-hmm. This is part of the escalation. We can do the same thing. We could start with with Ukraine and, and, and Russia. Yeah, you know, this is one of those area of, of the escalation. Yeah, sure. In the same way as we've started with with Ethiopia and Eritrea, yeah. with a project which was mm-hmm. an economic project. Mm-hmm. So these yeah. are new approaches that will, uh, we will the, not have one, one you know, uh, thing. A that single approach, yeah, exactly. I understand. But we need to diversify our yeah. approaches, and this is one way of that. Yeah, no, that's great. So let me get the response from both Ambassador Robuck and uh, Dave to the, that's, that second idea, the, the idea of, of um, uh, of spontaneous, locally driven, regionally driven, mm-hmm. uh, new structures, or, or simply yeah. non-led by anyone in particular, new new cooperative structures, uh, or uh, you know the the, the uh, creation of something with you know connected to NATO or with NATO or something. It's it's a complex set of ideas, mm. but it's it it it, it is a, a change. It would be a big change. So, what, uh, both of you, beginning with you, Ambassador Roebuck, and, and we're... You know. I mean, it's an interesting concept. It, uh, it sounds just w- what I've understood of it. It, it. it could be somewhat difficult to implement. Um, yeah. But, I mean, it has, it has promise. In the end, on a lot of these initiatives, somebody's going to have to lead. Yeah. Somebody's going to have to that, uh, shepherd yeah. and, and convene. I'm so glad uh, you said that. And if it, you know, I, I think the United States would welcome others taking... Uh, the lead on some of these things, and it's not the United States that have to do it, but I think somebody's got to take the lead. Um, and that's a key um, element to it, to make it make sure it works. Yeah, and it would have to be a country with, with the heft right. that, that could do it. And so I think in many instances, it's likely to be the U.S. or, or not at all. Or you could have a, a, a coalition of mid-level powers that could include some uh, one or two Gulf countries that may or may not you know, uh, fall into that category. Uh, what do you think, Dave? Well, I, I, I was just, while Mohammed was speaking, I was, I was like reflecting on the cultural triumph of the United States because you sound exactly like so many people I know from inside the U.S. government. And the problem is when people look at NATO, it's, it's sort of like when I go to the golf driving range and I'm standing and I'm trying to hit the golf ball there and my first shot goes, <laughs> CETO. Yeah. My second shot goes, <laughs> Organization of American States, yeah. and my third shot goes whoosh, Baghdad, Baghdad Pact, Pact yeah. and then my fourth shot goes whoosh, NATO. Perfect. That's yeah. my shot. <laughs> right. I'm done. I'm good. Yeah. You know, I've, we've had a bunch of misfires. <laughs> one good one, one really good, and one. that's the one that I'm like, I'm going to do this. You know, every time I go to the golf course, it's I'm going to have the NATO actually shot. Actually, stronger than ever now. That's well, really... yeah. I mean, it. it it's bigger. Than the, the track records of replicating or expanding NATO are not good. You're right. They're not good. No. Um, far more failure than success. And the, the second thing is, you know, I worked NATO in the Office of Secretary of Defense for three years and NATO Affairs in the Joint Staff for six years. And I got to tell you, um, from the American perspective, NATO is kind of like Destiny's Child, the, the musical group. We're Beyonce. And there's mm-hmm. two other people in it. I don't know who they are. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so, um, you know, when people say, yeah, we want NATO here, unfortunately, nothing in NATO really works unless it has, it's either a very peripheral part of NATO that is of great domestic interest, like uh, dealing with mass migration across the Mediterranean, which, you know, the French and the Italians are very interested in. Or it's got to have a strong American component, or it becomes irrelevant. And the problem is the United States aim in any regional partnership Mm -hmm. is not to increase American commitment and footprint, (laughs) is to increase the partner capacity. And unfortunately, what we've seen within NATO is um, 
once a country joins NATO, they tend to say, okay, our security is taken care of, right. and any impetus towards building but security think, actually goes backwards. This was, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was, uh, uh, Rob and I were talking about Finland. The, uh, the Finnish Deputy Minister of Defense, I remember in 2007, said one of the reasons why we have not joined NATO, of course they've decided mm -hmm. to now, was they said that we in Finland take our defense very seriously, yes. and we're worried that if we join NATO, yeah. our young people will right. step back from mm -hmm. securing the nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it, it's a concept, but honestly, I think that right now, given the current, you mentioned isolationism, mm -hmm. I think that there has to be tangible progress towards regional military integration before the United States yeah. will do more than a statement of, I'm speaking very frankly, yeah. a statement of support. Sure. Yeah, of course, it would be welcomed whenever, mm -hmm. you know, they, of course, they'll say, yes, yes, we're eager to right. do this. But in order to step beyond the, you know, ICI center in Kuwait so and the training thing, you've got in order to, make to really it believable, move forward, right? we've got to yeah. see some impetus from okay. the region because there's there's just too much demand. No, you know, the, make, other, the other two girls sense. in Destiny's Child want to get back with Beyonce right. and go on the road. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah. Uh, okay, we need to open it up for uh, questions from the audience, which I've been sort of derelict in doing. Uh, so I don't know if we have. Uh, there's a microphone. Uh, in the back there, if anybody wants to ask a question. Do we have roving microphones? Uh, oh, there's two microphones there, but uh, go ahead. Um, behind you, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the mic's on both sides. So if you have a, a question, that, that mic's open, and we welcome them. Why don't you introduce yourself, Mark? Hi, Mark Sievers. Thank um, you. For Mohammed, that's a little loud. Um, do you see a contradiction or a potential conflict between the Israeli model of deterrence of Iran and the UAE model of de-escalation? And, and how do those two, can they be mutually reinforcing mm. or are they potentially driving these two new partners apart? What an interesting question. question. Is there a complementarity? Uh, well, there is always a difference at the chance of integration. Mm. So yes, they are different. They could become even conflicting. And we've seen areas where this was almost conflicting. Mm. Uh, I mean, just before President Biden's you know, visit, there was this close idea of the Arab NATO with Israel. And it, and it was quite clear from the UAE, uh, Anwar Gargash came out and said, we don't want to be you know, part of this party or that party. So the, but the, the deterrence issue, uh, and, until now, uh, we haven't seen an attack from Iran direct on Israel. So that's this again the people, de deterrence. Right? It makes people think. Yeah. We haven't seen an obvious attack from Iran, from Israel on Iran. There were clandestine attacks. Hmm. And the operating uh, concept is that we will hit Iran outside Iran. Yeah. But, you know, obviously, uh, militarily, mm -hmm. but we will not do that. There, there are a lot of clandestine operations that are happening hmm. inside Iran. By, and I'm not saying that this is the right approach to do it, but my, my point is that the overall outcome is that there hasn't been a clash between the two countries. Yeah. It worth us to there, ask the, why and how is this? Uh, the Israeli red lines in Syria were in effect negotiated through actions, right? So the Israelis would make these statements about what they would accept and not accept and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, but the red lines became real, were reified by kinetic actions on both sides in Syria, especially by Israeli uh, airstrikes against uh, mm -hmm. Iranian assets that were either too close to the Golan Heights or too close to Israel, or it were in some way perceived as crossing an infrastructural line regarding mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, what, what Iran was building. Uh, so that's sort of the model. And mm -hmm. I think in a certain, is it, isn't it possible to say that um, those actions uh, are not, are ultimately can be complementary to the UAE approach of negotiating with Iran, of discussing with Iran. So on the one hand, you have your own dialogue with the Iranians. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the Israelis are creating uh, a sort of an atmosphere of deterrence in uh, another part of the Middle East, which is still relevant to UAE interests. 
But, but or, it, yeah. if I could just insert, there's also Please. an asymmetry sometimes in what and and how Iran approaches this de-escalation. Mm. That yeah. they will engage on it, and yet at the same time they will engage in actions that yeah. uh, you know involve asymmetric attacks, uh, intimidation, retaliation, uses of force, sometimes acknowledged, often not acknowledged. Right. So they play a double. They, they haven't bought into the into the, um, the the turn away from conflict and confrontation. Mm. I think that's very clear. They're willing to have dialogues with yeah. with uh, everyone who's willing to have a dialogue with it, except for the Israelis. But uh, you're absolutely right. They they retain the the network of armed gangs and they use them. Uh, Dave, what do you think about all of this? Is it- well, I, I I've. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm invited up here to give answers, but I'm going to give a question, which is no, I don't know. Do. I wonder if the UAE policy of de-escalation and engagement would be possible in the absence of the Israeli policy of deterrence and active mm-hmm. attacks. Uh, I think I, 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 I'm not saying that the two are coordinated, mm-hmm. but I'm, you know, symbiosis doesn't require direction, and um, so. I, I do think that it is clear to me that the Iranians um, have informally established, and we have conceded, we, all of us together, yeah. have conceded that there's a line beyond which they can operate with relative impunity. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons why I welcomed not so much the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, although that was very satisfying for me on an emotional level, <laughs> but I felt that the more the more significant death was Abdul Mahdi al Mohandas. So I totally agree with that. Yeah. yeah, because you know the 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 line that they operated under was if you know no matter how blatant an Iranian agent he was, if a person ob- obtained a position in the Lebanese yeah. government, the Iraqi he was treated as Lebanese and Iraqi. Yeah. And so at least momentarily, we kind of lowered that yes. threshold for operation. And I and I think oh. that it. I think that that was a positive step towards redefining the th- the level of acceptable deterrence on terms favorable to the United States and its security partners, to include uh, with, the UAE. Without doubt. And I think we should have pursued that lowering a little bit further. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're probably. I cer- it certainly was a uh, a successful re- reassertion of deterrence. I think mm-hmm. the big difference between uh, Soleimani and Al Mohandas is that the IRGC is a, is a uh, you know, they, they, maybe he was the star and the one with the most experience and knowledge, and, and it was a blow, but the IRGC is an institution. Yeah, exactly. The IRGC has yeah. someone else, and there's someone yeah. else, and someone there, else. There and, may be somebody so, better or worse, whereas, but somebody will move up. Yeah, yeah whereas yeah. the PMFs, there is no one exactly. uh, who could t- and did take the place of al-Muhandis, and it's still uh, chaotic. He, he was... Um, sort of a unique figure, and there in an institution, there is no unique figure, and that's yep. that's the big difference. So, um, I mean, I agree with you about deterrence and all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do we have a last question? Because if not, I think uh, yes, ma'am, go ahead, and this will be our final uh, one, and we'll answer and then we'll wrap it up. Go ahead, please. Thank you for for this uh, very important discussion. And uh, in the same question, if we add Saudi Arabia, we observed last month or this year, a huge change in, in foreign policy, and especially the five rounds of dialogue with Iran. So now, is it Saudi Arabia near to the uh, Emirati approach of this escalation mm. or the Israeli one? Or what we think the problem will be in the Iranians yeah. and the, this. Uh, no, it's, it's a great question. It's a this. great question Thank because you. you have you have, as you said, the, the dialogues at, in the uh, Iraqi airport in Baghdad airport, mm-hmm. but you still have the war in Yemen, uh, and so you yeah. So what do you think, uh, Mohammed? And then uh, we'll take final comments from the others. Uh, I, I think the answer is in the question. <laughs> I mean, uh, yes, there are not only the five rounds with, with and, 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 uh, you know, of, of dialogue with, with the Iranians in, in Baghdad, but there's also the direct dialogue with the Houthis. Right. And we've seen the Saudis talking directly, even mm-hmm. accepting mm-hmm. people who are on their own terror list uh, uh, coming into inside the Saudi Arabia. So uh, there is a, a, a de-escalation method. But uh, again, on Iran, and if I may just you add may. something. Uh, the real factor that is happening in Iran is not what we're doing to attack Iran or undermine it. 
it's what we're doing to develop inside. So my own views is that the transformation that's happening inside Saudi Arabia, economic and social, is what is actually triggering a comparison inside Iran. Why cannot we be the same? And that's why the, the attacks against someone like Masa Amini is not first of a kind. They have been happening for several years. Sure. Now they're different because by comparison, there are no milit you know, there's no moral police in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. uh, men and women have more social uh, liberty. There's more focus on, 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 on development and, 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 and prosperity. That is not there in Iran. So people are saying, why can't we have the same? And I think that is the type of cooperation model where it can kick in by saying, look, we can help with stabilizing by doing one, two, three. If you are willing to stop, put aside your attempt to gain power through security, try and gain power through economy. And, and, and that's a different approach, I think, that could become even more and more uh, valuable. Even to the uh, Iranian regime, who would want to reinvent itself now. My view, if there is going to be a revolution 2.0 in Iran, it's going to be economic, it's not going to be ideological. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I mean, my sense for what it's worth is that uh, Saudi Arabia would, would really like to join de-escalation, but it, it's, it's, um, uh, it's got obstacles that the UAE doesn't have, um, not only the quagmire in Yemen, but also the role it plays regionally, uh, the, which is a different role than the UAE does. Um, so final thoughts from Ambassador Robak and from uh, Mr. Durosh? I will just say uh, two things. I, I do think Saudi Arabia wants to have a similar type de-escalation uh, policy. I think they've uh, engaged in aspects of it. It'll be interesting mm. to see what kind of benefits they're able to draw, whether uh, so far these talks seem relatively um, sterile a little bit, but we'll, we'll see um, if they're able to engage and, and, and draw Iran out and, and develop something more uh, out of it. Well, they think they got the, the um, uh, truce or whatever it is in Yemen uh, out of those talks. What? They believe it was a direct result of, of the ne you know, negotiations with the Iranians. No, that's the UN guy who did that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's Tim. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they... they they're convinced of that, so they, that, that was at least one yep. maybe semi-useful thing. I don't know. So The, the only other point I would make is uh, on the interesting presentation Mohammed has made about uh, the yeah. UAE's de-escalation policy and, and efforts. It'll be interesting to see um, how um, relations with the United States uh, can fold into that and uh, either affect it or be affected by it, because I think it would be a very useful approach going forward. Um, let me let me just throw a curveball. So, um, uh, you know, the agenda of this focus is not just on conventional military security, but also on non-military security. So, in the 1990s, when I first entered the civil service, I was working in narcotics, mm -hmm. and uh, our we're, big we're, we all. <laughs> just, just our big fear <laughs> was that there would be the emergence of a, a narco state, like a yeah. fully controlled narco state right. in, in Central Columbia, America. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I know about working in security is we never really know where the next security threat is going to come from. Right. We now have a narco state, and it's in this region. It's Syria. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, the Captagon production by the Syrian government, the 4th Mechanized Brigade, which is the ultimate regime protection force of the Assad regime, um, produces, I think, a, a, it, it outgrosses the rest of the Syrian GDP by a factor of five. Yeah. Yeah. And it is producing narcotics extremely addictive methamphetamine, which are coming to this part of the region predominantly mm. Mm. and have the potential for causing great social damage in an area that um, has great resources, but also um, has not historically done well at dealing with behavioral So you're saying issues. they've moved beyond Captagon to actual methamphetamine? Uh, well, Captagon is, it's, is like a, it is a type of amphetamine that is yeah. arguably worse. So um, I think that that is a some Syria is a client of Iran. Some right. people describe it as a proxy, but the problem well, is, given that not huge not financial a involvement, it's a client. Yeah. Given that huge financial involvement, it is likely to carry on its own momentum, which eventually, even if Iran were to be cooperative, probably couldn't affect. Yeah. And I think that's going to be a profound security development that perhaps we can talk about yeah. over so this coffee. is this is a uh, 
you know, but Afghanistan is also potentially a narco state um, with the uh, with the development of uh, its own um, amphetamines made from mm. the local plants rather mm -hmm. than chemicals. Mm -hmm. In North Korea, yeah, is a, a kind of a narco state. Uh, yeah, uh, nar narcotics producing and exporting state. Right, but um, I well, don't think we've ever criminal. seen a state that's almost entirely funded. And you're cause. saying Syria I, I, I think we're seeing we're seeing state capture, and eventually that will carry on its own momentum and destabilizing progress, entirely devoid of issues of Iran, right. so which that, is how we tend to. That view then Syria. raises a huge security question: which exactly. is how do you deal with that, with a, a, a mafia yeah. state devoted to this, yeah. you know, set of drugs? So. Uh, with that, I will say thank you so much to uh, our uh, panel. It was wonderful. Mohammed, Ambassador Robak, and Dave, thank you so much, all of you. It was great. And um, thanks to the audience.